All right, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I guess uh, most of what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is Alberta's policy process and how we dealt with the combined, uh, the combined pressures of managing competitiveness while changing the climate policy approach in Alberta. So in addition to spending time at, uh, at the School of Business at U of A, I've also had two forays into government climate policy. I spent 2012, 2013 working uh, in Ottawa, and then I spent uh, 20, most of 2015 chairing Premier Notley's climate leadership panel in Alberta. So I think that makes me the only person in Canada who's worked on climate policy with both uh, Stephen Harper and Rachel Notley. The, um, the picture that you see on the screen is, is probably my favorite picture from the process, most of, mostly because I'm not in it. Uh, and this was the, the photo from Premier Notley's announcement of, of the Alberta climate change policy. And, and with her on the stage, in addition to the Minister of Environment and First Nations representatives, are representatives from uh, four of the five major oil companies in Alberta, as well as executive directors from uh, major environmental groups across Canada. And the similar photo shoot was replicated a couple of weeks later with some of our major electricity companies. And what that, I think, tells you is that, uh, and part of why it makes me, it's a picture that I really like, is because up until a few weeks before, it seemed that uh, it would be me and the Premier standing on stage and everybody from each of those groups throwing tomatoes. So we were able to build a reasonable balance, and I think a lot of how we were able to do that was by coming up with a policy that, at the same time as it uh, provided price signals and rewards for innovation and stringent requirements on certain sectors, it also provided significant protections for, uh, for competitiveness. So again, blame me for any of this, don't blame anybody else. Uh, so I, I've got to bounce through this pretty quickly, but after a long process in Alberta, what we recommended our panel, what was largely adopted by the government for Alberta, uh, was an economy-wide carbon price starting at $30 a ton. And increasing, we recommended an increase, it's still a flat nominal terms in the Alberta budget. But what we were able to do was build on an existing policy that, it, that was in place in Alberta called Specified Gas Emitters Regulation and essentially make two changes to it. Make it broader, so take it from only pricing emissions on the largest industrial facilities to pricing almost all of the emissions in the economy. And then I would argue most of what I'm going to talk about today is make it better by improving the way in which we dealt with competitiveness and the way we dealt with uh, emissions intensive and trade exposed sectors. The previous policy, if I can put it to you in really simple terms, it gave more free emissions credits to firms with higher historic emissions intensities. So if you think of it in terms of giant novelty checks, this was the equivalent of the government coming out every year and giving the most emissions intensive firms in the province a larger giant check as part of Alberta's climate change program, which if you think about it for even half a second is entirely backwards. And so what we did was change it so that emissions allocations would be based on performance benchmarks uh, so that the industry as a whole could be made whole for competitiveness purposes, but you still retain all the things that economists like about carbon pricing in terms of rewarding innovation and providing a marginal incentive to reduce emissions while not leading to the emissions leakage effects that Michael talked about so well in his talk. So we also complemented that with some other stuff, and I'll only get to quickly touch on these, but uh, you know, the biggest one that just came up earlier this morning, I think Alberta was key to Canada's momentum towards pushing for a coal phase out. So Alberta with coal plants that were permitted, even under an accelerated phase out federally introduced in 2011, 2012, Alberta had coal plants permitted through to 2056. We now have a coal phase out by 2030, along with an aggressive renewables program, uh, methane regs, and some energy efficiency programming. So uh, I won't spend, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but Dave highlighted this in his talk. He said Alberta's, instead of focusing on targets, what we did was focus on policies and say, what is a policy that we can look at and say this is credible in the national context? And so we picked the highest carbon price that exists in Canada right now and said it's perfectly reasonable in at the most emissions intensive or one of the most emissions intensive economies in, in Canada that our emitters face at least a, a price at least as high, but no higher than what's faced by other similar emissions in, in the rest of Canada. So we picked um, $30 a ton, coincidentally significantly higher than the EU ETS, Ontario, Quebec, California, et cetera. Um, and uh, I'll skip the, the price increase there. But the big challenge we ran, and, and um, Michael put up the graph of emissions intensity in Europe, Simply put, about 20% of Alberta's GDP falls into those emissions intensive and trade exposed sectors. So oil sands, 
electricity doesn't count in that, but uh, cement, petrochem, refining, uh, et cetera, all fall into natural gas, natural gas processing, all fall into that emissions intensive and trade exposed sector. So you're setting policy in Alberta, unlike say BC, where you've got one or 2% of the economy that's emissions intensive and trade exposed, you've got a really big economic hurdle to overcome. Couple that with the fact that most of these industries, in addition to being emissions intensive, are also electricity intensive. And our electricity sector is also emissions intensive. So you've sort of got a double whammy if you start dealing with emissions policy that you're going to have the risk of both making them uh, uncompetitive on an emissions cost basis and on an electricity cost basis. So we have to figure out how to deal with that. And so I'm going to highlight a couple of industries today, oil sands and, and electricity, just to show you some graphs. So this was the oil sands industry, and what you're looking at, the size of the bubbles on the graph are the barrels per day production of the oil sands sector. Going across the x-axis is their emissions intensity of production, and on the y-axis is their average cost per barrel from greenhouse gas emissions. So what you see is basically there is no pattern. It's like someone took a paintball gun and shot it at the screen. Some of the lowest emissions firms have some of the highest compliance costs. Some really high compliance firms or high emissions firms have virtually no compliance cost. And that's because they weren't rewarded for having low emissions. They were rewarded for improving relative to their own historic performance. So I tell my students this, I say, well, imagine if I graded all of your future papers on the basis of your performance on your first paper. Well, I'd get a really bad set of first papers. That's not exactly what was happening with Alberta oil sands, but it's, it's sort of related. The rewards for design phase innovation were really small. So I'm just going to switch the axis on this. It's the same graph, but with a different axis, so that I can give you an apples to apples comparison. So the first thing you wanted to do with a policy is create the marginal incentive to do better at every step of the way. So when you take that specified gas emitters reg and shift it to just a performance benchmark, that's what you get. So you get the same firm, same emissions data. These are now new compliance costs. Those with the highest emissions intensities have the incentive to reduce their emissions. And the slope of that line all of a sudden is $30 a ton. So you have a much different slope. You have gains to innovation all the way along the spectrum. But what you don't have is the full average cost of compliance that you would have with a full carbon tax in place. So if we went to the straight BC model and said, we're going to give you a carbon tax, but we're going to give you a cut in corporate income tax to go along with it, that's what you'd get. So you get the same linear relationship between emissions and um, cost of compliance, but you get a lower total average cost of, of production. So you're not driving the production out, in fact, you're subsidizing production while keeping uh, the emissions, the incentive to reduce emissions. The other place, how am I doing for time here? Uh, six minutes. Six minutes, perfect. Um, the other place where we had a lot of work to do was the electricity. Alberta's electricity sector depends a lot on coal. And actually, in the last couple of years, one of the dynamics that you're seeing coming out is we're ramping our coal plants a lot more. We built a whole bunch of new gas capacity. And so in 15, 16, 17, uh, and now into 2018, you're seeing a lot more variability in our coal plants, which has both greenhouse gas emissions and air quality implications. So what we tried to do was shift, again, same model into electricity. And the rationale for doing that, no, electricity is not emissions intensive, nor is it trade exposed. But there were two things that we looked at. Number one, a lot of our emissions intensive industries are electricity intensive. So there's a competitiveness impact on electricity. Second thing is Alberta's electricity system is very decentralized. So you have a lot of direct connect entities. You have a lot of individual players in the market, 250 to 300 direct connect entities in the market. So unlike a California system where you can say, here, distribution utilities, you take the value of the permits and pass these through on bills. You try to do that in Alberta, you've got two or 300 entities that you're dealing with, uh, and it's a much more, complicated, uh, much more complicated system. So we didn't do that. But what we did is complement the, uh, and this is to the spirit of what some of the other people are talking about this morning, we said, okay, we'll complement the price with a regulatory backstop, which was the coal phase out, and a renewable support program to drive in some, some of the things we wanted to have happen in the, in the province. So this is what that same sort of output-based allocation story looks like in electricity. 
before the policy change, our most emissions intensive coal plant in the province was getting the equivalent of a $35 a megawatt hour subsidy for every unit of electricity through the province's greenhouse gas emissions program. So we're subsidizing coal-fired power output at a higher rate than we're subsidizing our most efficient gas plant. In fact, at three times the rate that we're subsidizing our most efficient gas plant. So what we did was very simple. We said level it, treat everybody the same. Give everybody the same uh, average cost of, um, or sorry, give everyone the same output-based allocation, keep the power price impact mitigated. So that has some efficiency consequences, but it also has some carbon leakage consequences. And so what that meant was that actually the expectation was natural gas power would get cheaper, coal power would get substantially more expensive, renewable power would get cheaper, and so you're tilting the playing field in the ways you want, uh, you want things to happen. The renewables advantage was then again supplemented by the equivalent of a clean power call from the government. And if you missed the news, we just had the first uh, procurement uh, success story. So we had wind power procured on contracts for differences, but the costs of those wind power contracts were, I believe, 37, 41, and 44 dollars a megawatt hour. So well, well below uh, what we've seen in any other jurisdiction in Canada for cost of procurement of wind power. Situation that the government was facing going into it, we're at record low electricity prices. So these are Alberta power prices uh, through the last 20 years, or almost 20 years. And we've been in a period of really low power prices. So politically, this is interesting because, of course, nobody remembers what their bill was three years ago. They remember what it was last year. So I'm already seeing people complain about the astronomical increase in their power bills in 2018, even though they've never paid, they barely ever paid lower power prices. But the government was faced with you know, the risk that, yes, we have this artificially low power price. It's going to mask the impact of any sort of carbon price uh, change. This is not a sustainable low power price. It was never going to be. Uh, and then you couple that, and here's the aggressiveness of the coal phase that was coming in here. You need a policy which also allows you to have reasonable investment in a very short time frame. Uh, I was telling Dr. Allen at lunch, one of the things that, that plays in here as well is these coal plants are also affected by some uh, air, pretty significant air quality regulations that tighten after 2020 on the majority of the plants. And interestingly, even though you hear a lot in, in the US about you know, the war on coal and all of these things, it was interesting to see this play out in Alberta because, because of these tightening environmental policies on air quality, what you had, the biggest concern for us and the thing that we confronted every day from the regulator was not how can you get coal out of the system by 2030. That's relatively easy. It was actually how do you keep um, coal from exiting the system very quickly. And there was a lot of critique of economists this morning. Well, economists, you know, the sort of armchair economist in the newspaper says, oh yeah, just do a carbon tax. But actually in most economics classes you learn about something called the theory of the second best. A little audience participation. How many of you value reliability in the electricity system? We all put up our hands, right? But if you just put a carbon price in the electricity system, it might be that the lowest cost abatement is to click those coal plants off tomorrow. But it takes a while to build new natural gas plants, new renewables, new storage, new grid, etc. And so if the reaction, the first the reaction of the firms to what would be the first best policy is just to shut down, and oh, it turns out you don't have a price on long-term reliability, which Alberta's system doesn't, you're in a problem of the second best where your carbon policy can exacerbate an existing market failure. So that was actually what we had to guard against, way more than what you hear in the news of what's going to happen when uh, we phase out coal. It was much more of a challenge of what's going to happen in the near term. So I won't spend any time on the, on the other stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a mass of other policies in Alberta, but I'm well out of time. So this is where you find me, usually ranting on Twitter, or uh, you can get me by email. Thanks very much. <laughs>